January 1998. This was the beginning of an earthquake. There is speculation tonight that as many as one dozen police officers in West New York could soon be facing federal indictments. At the time, it was the largest police corruption case in the history of the state of New Jersey. In announcing the takeover of the West New York Police Force, the Hudson County prosecutor said the move was necessary to restore faith in the department. The West New York Police Department has been under a cloud for the last few months. The allegations that were being disseminated by the press, it was shocking. The federal task force connected the cops to a prostitution ring. Pretty much the who's who of the West New York Police Department made a total of $130,000 in bribes from that alone. You had Cuban organized crime heads, and then you had the chief making tons of money, and it was unholy alliance. We had extortion, racketeering, illegal sale of alcohol and gambling. And this was a case that for a long time blurred the lines between law and order and organized crime. It's fair to say that this played out like a Martin Scorsese film, and the difference is it was 100% real life. This case changed the entire fabric of this community. It flipped the police department on its head. It turned my world upside down, totally consumed my life. Every day I went to work, I put my life on the line because I went undercover to work for the FBI. I was ostracized. I was. I was exiled. I was exiled from this community. By doing what I did, I lost everything. I lost it all. Over one dozen police officers will soon be facing federal indictments. This was the worst case of police corruption ever. The cops were charged with stealing over $1 million in taxpayer funds. I went from putting handcuffs on people to having handcuffs put on me. For decades, West New York was considered a safe town in New Jersey that stood in the tall shadow of the Big Apple. Measuring just one square mile, its proximity to the city has attracted people from all walks of life. West New York is basically right across the Hudson River from the west side of Manhattan, a very densely populated town with a police force. It's a blue collar town. It's really gritty. A lot of hardworking individuals, different ethnicities, a tremendous melting pot. Cubans, uh, Colombians, some Central Americans, an Italian population. In that square mile, we have over 50,000 people, but everybody knew everybody. But by the early 90s, mob culture had also moved in and began quietly spreading like a cancer through the community. And the West New York Police Department was not immune. By the end of the decade, every member of the force would face a stark choice, either take a stand against corruption or become a part of it. I was born and raised in West New York. So, so this was the way into the house. Right here was the dining room table. And then this is where my parents uh, slept. My dad went to high school, the same high school I graduated from. And my mom went to the Catholic school right across the street. That's how they met. When we needed something that we didn't have in the pantry, my grandmother lived right next door. So we'd come over to the window, and we'd open it up, and then we'd take turns reaching across and grabbing whatever it was, the eggs, the butter, the bread, and, and that's, that's how we got stuff from grandma. When I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I had no clue. I was an aggressive, hard-nosed football player, and a lot of my close friends from the football team got involved with the police auxiliary. I said to myself, I'm not the type of guy to sit behind a desk. So I said, okay, um, I'll go to college. And after that, I was gonna be a West New York police officer. Rich Rivera was just one of many young people recruited from West New York's high school football team. It was the perfect training ground. 
because several officers were coaches and the head referee was none other than future police chief Alexander Oriente. I am Stacy Oriente, the daughter of Alexander Oriente. My father was born in West New York, New Jersey in 1933. He was a Depression era kid and he was very much a town son. He was captain of the football team, captain of the baseball team. He had hoped to be a professional sports player, but unfortunately he had an injury when he was in the Navy. So when he came home from the Korean War, the family said, well, Lefty, you've got a choice. You can either be a cop, a fireman, or a garbage man. He said, I'm not hauling garbage and I'm not running into burning buildings, so I guess I'll be a cop. Starting out was a little bit of a rough start, but he stuck to it and eventually became a really vested member of the West New York Police Department. Chief Oriente was somebody that, you know, had high remarks from his peers and, uh, you know, was looked at as like a patriot, as a hero in the community. He was somebody that was clearly politically connected and politically savvy, and I think that's what helped him move through the ranks the way that he did. He got a reputation on the street of being somebody that you could go to when you had a problem that maybe you wouldn't necessarily go to a police officer for. People just naturally looked to him. He was a leader. And he was the last chief that West New York ever had. Nicholas Farrell, Brian J. George Mundo, Jr. In 1994, I get the call that I'm going to be uh, hired. I was nervous, but it was a great opportunity. And within two weeks, I got the notice, you're going to the academy. I was in exceptional physical condition. I was ready for this made sure I kept my academics above a 94 percentile. I hadn't picked up a gun in my life, but I learned real quick how to shoot, and I got the highest honors out of over 50 people for shooting in my class. My mother was extremely proud of my brother. She was fearful, but she was extremely supportive. One of my, my first assignments, I'm a patrolman walking the street. Being in uniform on patrol, our thing was just to, to hump from job to job to job, respond to people's needs, fill out a report, and that's a done deal. Very harmonious, everybody looked out for each other. There's no one going after each other, there's no jealousies, there was no animosities. You're cohesive, you do everything together. One for all, all for one. But you're also now being indoctrinated to the blue wall of silence because what happens is you're covering for that guy. 20 years old, this is what I'm learning. There's no more individuality. You're all a team. The blue wall of silence is the universal unspoken code among police officers. Don't report your fellow officers. Their errors, misconduct, or even their crimes. And there's another lesson I learned in law enforcement. Some people really don't deserve to wear a badge. So I'm walking the beat in the upper third part of town late at night. And I hear one of the guys I work with very frequently over the radio. And he's screaming out, three, two, shots fired. So I gotta try and get down to his zone. So I start running. I run from 62nd and Adams to 62nd and Jackson. And there's a car at the red light. I decide I'm gonna come and deal with the car. So I reach for the door, and the guy rolls down the window. It's Carmine Gator. He's a detective that we work with, and he's off duty. And now I'm happy because there's another cop. 
I said, Carmine, we got shots fired. This, this guy's on the radio, he, he's in trouble. And Carmine looks over to me and he goes, I'm, I'm with my wife and, and I'm taking her home. And I was shocked because Carmine was only worried about Carmine. I wanted to lay into this piece of shit. You don't leave another man? About two weeks later, I'm going to the grocery store. I see Carmine. So Carmine's down in my neck of the woods, and he's coming at a very nondescript storefront. And he's way on the other side of town from where he's supposed to be working. I look around. I don't see any police cars, and there's nothing to buy in this store. So I look at it as being weird. But I know where he is. He is at the epicenter of the entire universe of all things bad happening in the street. This is where all the crimes are taking place, people gambling illegally, and stuff like that. So I'm just watching him come out of this storefront. And he walks out, and he looks both ways and he's got this paper bag in his hand. It just struck me, you know, because I'm adding two and two and I'm getting 10 in my head. I don't know what he's doing here. I know what that place is, but I got no proof. And I say to myself, that envelope was probably cash. This is potentially a dirty cop. There was this renaissance of young Hollywood people. Like everyone was sneezing fame all over each other. From the network that brought you Dark Side of the Ring and Dark Side of Football, now it's time to unravel the 90s. The era that brought us grunge, reinvented hip hop, and gave birth to the internet. We're all doing what we're supposed to do, and this is how it ends. Dark Side of the 90s. New episode, Thursday at 10 on Vice. In 1994, beat cop Rich Rivera started to suspect that one of his superiors in the West New York Police Department was on the take. But he would soon learn that for the West New York PD, accepting kickbacks was nothing new. My dad joined the force in 1956. There was an instance where they had gone out on a raid and they discovered a cash box. And so they were like, yeah, rookie, go out in the hallway, just, you know, watch the door. And a few minutes later, the commanding officer came out with a folded $20 bill and popped it in my dad's pocket and said, tell your wife we said Merry Christmas. Now, that seems pretty innocuous when you say it, but in that moment, he knew if he didn't take the $20 bill, he was gonna be an outsider. And so he took it, and that's what started it all. Some 40 years after Oriente joined the West New York PD, another rookie on the force was about to be indoctrinated into the same culture. After witnessing fellow detective Carmine Gaeta concealing what looked like a bag of dirty money, Officer Rich Rivera did what cops are paid to do. He started investigating. I'm thinking to myself, this is potentially a dirty cop. I'm gonna see if I get into the bottom of this. So now I start doing my own research. I spend a little more time down there on Hudson Avenue, seeing what's going on. I see Carmine coming out of storefronts, same places. So I start going to some of these bodegas and I'm looking around for myself. I'm just poking around. I'm buying a soda, I'm buying a bag of chips. And you hear the machines. They're all playing in the background. You know, they have a very distinct tone to them. These were the Joker Poker machines. Joker Poker are electronic video games. And you get credit, just like you could build credit up on any other video game. You build up a certain number of credits and now you're gonna get cashed out. Now you have gambling. You're pretty much running a casino in a little bodega on Hudson Avenue. 
West New York was a hotbed for illegal gambling. And in the back room of every one of these bodegas or convenience stores were these illegal gambling machines, Joker Poker, uh, primarily. There was a criminal organization um, run by Jose Grana, his son, Jose Grana Jr. And the Grana family had uh, the monopoly on all these machines. The Grana family ran a shady operation that was known to have deep ties to the Cuban mob. But Carmine wasn't citing the business for illegal machines. Instead, he was holding a conspicuous paper bag, which made Rivera all the more suspicious. Any moron could see that the cops weren't investigating anything. Somebody in the police department was getting a piece of the action. Because when there's an illegal place in town and it's operating, pretty much right out in the open, it's the cops that offer the protection. In regard to the illegal gambling machines, I had no idea that they existed or that my dad was involved with them. I had some idea as I got older that there was a percentage of the revenue that they generated that was given to the police officers, in this case, my father or whomever he was working with, to allow the machines to be there. Sort of hush money, <laughs> look over their money. The West New York Police Department had a lot of side hustles like this going on. Some officers ended up uh, rolling up on people as part of regular town business. Say someone was getting thrown out of a bar on a Friday, Saturday night, they would take his watch, they would take his wallet, maybe even swipe a credit card, and kind of just cut him loose in the middle of the street. And that was that. This was just really totally shocking because at the end of the day, this was you know, sworn officers of the police department. One day, I'm working in the traffic division and there was gambling machines in our impound yard. And all of the machines are broken into and someone stole all the computer motherboards and the bill acceptor, which are the two most expensive components. And the only person that could have done that was a cop. We were the only ones that had access to that. So at that moment, it's, uh-huh. Now I see how this game is played. I realized the chief and all of the higher echelon in the criminal scheme, both in the, in the mafia and in the police department, not only did they turn a blind eye, these other cops are involved. At the end of the day, I believe principle over all other things. And, and, and it ate me up. All of these things are falling in place. So I knew I had to do something because I firmly believed in the profession and upholding all those standards. And that bad cops make good cops look horrible. And I say to myself, where can I even go with this information? Because I want to get it off my chest. I want to give it to someone that's going to do something with it. But if you go to the Internal Affairs Unit, they're going to tell the chief that they're going to know that someone's trying to speak out. And if it's someone, you know, from the force, that could be potentially bad things for them. As a cop, you've got to follow your instincts. And I knew everything ran through Alexander Oriente. If there's a potential for police officers in my police department that are dirty, I have to assume he knew what was going on. And that's when I realized, hey, I got to go above and beyond all this. So now I'm like, let me call the FBI. I went from putting handcuffs on people to having handcuffs put on me. Extortion. Somebody in the police department was getting a piece of the action. Bribery. Every drug that was being smuggled, they had a part in. Corruption. By doing what I did, I lost everything. You say that's worth it. Was it worth it? True stories of cops turned criminal, betraying the badge. New episode, Monday at 10. Part of Investigation Night on Vice. When Officer Rich Rivera began to question the culture within the West New York PD, he quickly discovered that his fellow officers routinely turned a blind eye to illegal gambling. And to add insult to injury, they seemed to be taking bribes. So Rivera decided to turn to someone he could trust. If what I think is true, 
that there's a potential for police officers in my police department that are corrupt, they're taking bribes. That shouldn't exist. So I called the FBI about potential corruption at my department. A week later, I'm sitting down with the FBI. And they say, listen, you know, we're interested in targeting the Cuban mafia because they had a long history of fire bombings and murders and a huge wide scale sports betting operation in town. And he's telling me that what they'd have to do from an FBI operational standpoint is probably put an undercover in. And I've already got my picture in my head of what FBI agents look like. And they don't look like me. And they're not Cuban. And they're not from the neighborhood. And I'm like, you know, I just put my ass on the line for this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go wear wire for the FBI. And I had one condition, which was I'm not investigating cops. I give you anybody and everybody off the street and they will give you the cops because everybody talks. And that's it. I went undercover to work for the FBI. With just a year on the force, Rich was taking on an undercover mission to investigate corrupt cops and mob bosses. But the FBI needed someone on the inside, and they were banking on the fact that no one would suspect a rookie like Rich Rivera. So it started off in earnest in January 95. I was given a recorder from the FBI. I had to become a criminal. I had to learn how they acted. I had to understand what they thought. Not only a criminal, but a dirty cop. To put it very succinctly, I went from a Boy Scout to a Kingpin. What Mr. Rivera did was completely inconceivable. If you had a problem, you could have directly addressed it with the people who you thought were involved. You could have walked away. Why would you go to the FBI if you weren't aware of a situation and you just had an inkling of it? And if you knew what was going on, why were you still there? And why did you still want to be a part of it? What me and the FBI decided was Joker Poker was my way in, because this was a blatant, obvious thing to pick up on. But I was really nervous. This was the first go around. You know, I know I'm targeting the, the Cuban mafia, but at the same time, I had to keep a cool head because now I'm going into the belly of the beast. January 24th, 1995. It was me and the FBI and we planned for me to hit this bodega at 6417 Park Avenue. We hit it on purpose because we know it belongs to Jose Grana and the Cuban Mafia. And he's going to come after me. The ding, 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 ding is going on in the back room. So we meander over to the back room and, oh my God, here it is. It's a gambling machine. I set it up on the counter, right in front of the owner. So I open it up and I take out all the money. And in comes one of Grana's employees, who knew me. Oh my God, what'd you guys do? Do you know what's gonna happen? And then I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was you guys. I thought this was somebody else. But this is exactly what we wanted to happen, because now we're shaking the tree. And Mafia connections, they're getting made. And just like that, Rivera had a toehold in the culture of mob cop collusion. The price of entry? A willingness to look the other way and a raw feeling of paranoia. I was pretending to be tough as nails, but in the back of my mind, is worried about getting one in the back of my head. It was uh, a whole new world that I had to learn and understand and real quickly, because I had to worry about getting whacked. And I say, uh, listen, this is what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna write it up. We leave all the money on the table. 
That money never made it back to anywhere. The employees took it. This very first raid opened up Pandora's box because it gets back to the police chief. Now he thinks I broke these machines and took the money. Mr. Rivera was called into my dad's office to discuss a situation where his actions weren't necessarily in line with how the police should be behaving. We basically gave Richie a talking to and let him know his actions were not appropriate and that he should just, you know, keep himself in line. Rich never touched the money, but he was reprimanded anyway. Not for stealing, but for taking a piece of Oriente's side business. And that was another holy shit moment. The chief is the one that's getting paid to protect these spots. And I just whacked his spot. There was this renaissance of young Hollywood people. Like everyone was sneezing fame all over each other. From the network that brought you Dark Side of the Ring and Dark Side of Football, now it's time to unravel the 90s. The era that brought us grunge, reinvented hip hop, and gave birth to the internet. We're all doing what we're supposed to do, and this is how it ends. Dark Side of the 90s. New episode, Thursday at 10. On Vice. January 95. I came to the realization that there's no way that this organization or the police departments were the way they were without failed leadership. I'm sure that a lot of people believe that my dad was this king of crime, you know, sitting on his throne like some comic book character, but that wasn't the case at all. It wasn't organized. It wasn't disorganized, but it wasn't organized crime. This is something that just existed and everybody kind of just went through it. I think with my dad, it all came down to bad timing. My dad was the one that was sitting in the chief's chair when this all came to pass. The culture that existed originated far before my dad. The players may have changed, but the game didn't. The chief and other senior members of the force had basically been involved in police corruption for you know decades. People paying off to have their criminal business protected, committing acts of extortion on local contractors, and it had been going on for quite some time. The chief of police breached the public trust because he never prevented the criminality that was going on in the department in any way. But while corruption raged on beneath the surface at the West New York Police Department, Patrolman Rich Rivera went deeper into the belly of the beast, hobnobbing with gangsters while quietly gathering intel as an undercover agent. After the very first raid is done, I just popped Jose Grana's machine, and now he wants to chum up to me because he thinks I'm a player. He starts asking me, hey, who are you, kid? Let's get to know each other. We're the same age. He's not stupid. He realizes one day he's going to be the boss of all operations. He realizes, I'm a patrolman. One day, I'm going to be the chief. I'm going to take over the operations. Let's start this relationship 20 years in advance, and we'll be gazillionaires when it's all over. That's his thinking. And I made it a point to go anywhere and everywhere and gain as much intelligence as I could to report back to the FBI. Rich Rivera uh, helped gather a ton of incriminating evidence, and as it turned out, the West New York Police Department had no shortage of corrupt schemes going on. Video gambling morphed into work in security outside of nightclubs that were staying open late. That morphed into sports betting operations. You name it, I was running the rackets. And the West New York Police Department, we were protecting all these rackets, permeating throughout the entire police department. So many people were involved in all of these different illegal activities. It was just, it was mind blowing to this day in one square mile. So in the meantime, everybody that I met in the street liked me. 
They wanted to work with me. In my opinion, Mr. Rivera went to the FBI with this big story of all the corruption in West New York to try to make himself look like a hero. That's something that truly only he knows, but it just seemed like there was this one shining moment of glory and he just keeps holding on to it and milking it for all it's worth. And reinventing myself from the Boy Scout to the crooked cop, I had the Cuban mafia and every one of these illegal business owners say, you know what, because you show up. You put the time in, you put the effort, you tell it like it is. We really like to work with you. The problem is I became so big, so popular, so fast, and I'm making so much money, I'm taking food off his plate, taking it off the plate of the chief, his whole gang, his band of thieves, and I'm a big time player. And they're super pissed off about all this. While Rivera's success in the rackets continued to surge, so did Oriente's irritation. Until July of 1995, when Rivera's mental fitness was called into question. So they sent me to a psychiatrist. It was for a fitness for duty. And that's when I knew things were up. Because this guy's on the payroll. He's just going to make up whatever it is they want. And that's it. I'm finished. The Amazon, caught between its rich traditional past and its fast-moving future, between those who wish to exploit it and those who want to protect it. Fortuna para quem segurou. Si no no hubiera matado a mi padre, aquí hubiera estado petrolera. Keep the balance. Man. Wow. Unknown Amazon, with me, Pedro Andrade. New episode Tuesday at ten on Vice. Less than a year into Rich Rivera's undercover investigation of the West New York Police Department, Rivera had become a big player in the shady intersection between the cops and the Cuban mob. But his success made him an even bigger target for the chief of police, who sent him to a psychiatrist for fitness for duty. Oriente couldn't trump up enough to, to just outright get rid of me. And that's when I knew things were up, because it's only a short move between suspension and getting fired. While forces within the PD moved to get rid of him, Rivera was under pressure to move his investigation to the next level. He could prove his fellow officers were on the take, but his gut told him he was on the precipice of discovering just how deep and dark their crimes really were. At this point in time, there's a crossover between one guy who owns a bar and wants to pay for me to keep him open late at night, illegally, and prostitution. He introduces me to this guy, Roberto. And Roberto tells the guy sitting there that he's already working with the police chief. Roberto's a, um, he's a pimp. His wife's a madam. She's running the brothel. And they're running it out of this nail salon, uh, Chantel's. Just like I would get involved with the cafes and restaurants and stuff, I'm going in for Manny Petty. So I do that for a couple of times. So now they used to seeing me there. They don't know I'm a cop, just another client. And then payday. I'm driving by and I see Oriente's car parked outside. And I'm thinking, he's at Chantel. You know what? It's a great time to go get a Manny. And I walk up the stairs to the top, and I hear some girls chuckling, and I hear a man's voice. Yeah. Boom. There's Lieutenant Alexander Oriente, the chief's son. One of the girls playing with his hair, tickling him. He's living it up, sitting on the couch. And I go, hey, Alex, how's it going? And I turn right to one of the other women. I go, you available? You know, get the nails done? And sit down like nothing happened. That was the connection we made to the brothel. But whatever evidentiary value I would have captured on the recording was just Alex greeting me, hello. Snapped a few pictures of the car sitting outside. And that's it. 
But this all gets reported to the FBI. We sit down, I hand over the recordings to them, give them any intel, and then they approach the madam of the brothel, Anna, and they flip her. And ultimately, she began to cooperate with the FBI. Eight months into the investigation, the walls were closing in on Chief Oriente. As the investigation snowballed, Rich was no longer the only one gathering intel for the FBI. Soon, even people deeply tied to the chief's biggest criminal schemes began to flip. This was a brothel, uh, you know, prostitution ring, whatever you want to call it, that was frequented regularly by West New York police officers. And uh, they were fully protected because they paid up. Anna Teresa Rodriguez Morales wore a wire and uh, helped gather a ton of incriminating evidence. She was able to bribe the chief and some other officers about $130,000. We're golden. This is a home run. Now we just connected the cops to a prostitution ring. If there was any chance for the chief to refute evidence collected by a shady madam, that hope vanished when it was revealed that Rich Rivera wasn't the only West New York police officer wearing a wire for the FBI. The FBI, they began an investigation by confronting a corrupt sergeant on the job. His name was Carmine Gaeta. Uh, Carmine Gaeta, he agreed to flip. He agreed to wear a wire as well. He gives up everybody that he could to save himself, and it begins to snowball for the chief and his crew. Gaeta and the chief were, were close friends. So there was mountains and mountains and mountains of evidence. There was a, a, a towing company that had a, a kickback scheme. There was a house of prostitution, and it was like an unholy alliance between Cuban organized crime and the chief of police, Oriente. This case evolved to something that was huge. Uh, all of the top targets, both in the, in the mafia and in the police department, they start rolling over on each other. They're, they're tripping over each other to cooperate with the FBI. As the dominoes slowly start to fall, it was very difficult for me because when you're a kid and you grow up in North Jersey and you're watching Goodfellas and you're watching The Godfather and you know, you've got it drilled into your head about street justice and you don't rat on your friends, it definitely was heartbreaking for me to watch everything unfold. In January 1996, I raid a spot, 6057 Palisade Avenue, another well-planned out operation. One small detail Rich left out. <laughs> Rich was supposed to be at the doctor's office for a session with a psychiatrist. That hurt because I'm ordered to be there. Doesn't matter if you're rescuing people from a burning building. You're supposed to be at the doctor's office. When Rich Rivera missed a psychiatrist session during a gambling raid, that gave Chief Oriente all the ammunition he needed to suspend Rich from the force. And to make matters worse, Rivera had a falling out with the FBI. The FBI says, well, now that you're suspended, you got more time on your hands. Go ingratiate yourself with, with these players and go work full time for them. I go, all right, so wait a minute. Now I'm gonna be working full time for a criminal enterprise and I'm gonna have potentially the criminal exposures and this whole thing could flip on me? Nah, no thanks. One of the main concerns in working with the FBI was that there should be no adverse job actions against me. But I should have read between the lines that something bad could happen to you and it's not on their shoulders. I lost everything. I lost, I lost it all. I went from putting handcuffs on people to having handcuffs put on me. Extortion. Somebody in the police department was getting a piece of the action. Bribery. Every drug that was being smuggled, they had a part in it. Corruption. By doing what I did, I lost everything. Did you say that's worth it? 
Was it worth it? True stories of cops turned criminal, betraying the badge. New episode, Monday at 10. Part of Investigation Night on Vice. By January 1998, the FBI had the evidence they needed to put together an ironclad case against officers of the West New York Police Department, including the chief. It was a three-year investigation that started with a beat cop named Rich Rivera. His undercover recordings exposed widespread extortion, bribery, prostitution, illegal gambling, and potential racketeering, all centered around some of the most powerful men in town mobsters Jose Grana Jr. and Sr., and police chief Alex Oriente. The West New York Police Department has been underage. As it all started to come crumbling down, Chief Oriente ended up resigning. Was the chief pressured in any way to retire or resign? Well, the chief came in and handed his letter for resignation. You know, of course, people wanted to know why. He wasn't particularly forthcoming about what was going on. My father was made aware of the charges. The attorney had said to him, you need to resign, retire now, because you don't want this to happen while you're a sitting chief. Then it becomes an even bigger story. I believe the way that it was presented is Chief Oriente is stepping down at this time to spend more time with his family, his grandchildren, his wife, etc. And obviously that was not the case. This entire document is a 69 count RICO indictment. RICO, the same way they go after the mafia. And ultimately, the police department is prosecuted as a racketeering enterprise. And this is what I expose. RICO is racketeering. And getting convicted of racketeering is a big deal because the RICO claim says you're basically running, you know, a mob activity. Classic organized crime routine. You know, the crew commits street-level crimes and has to kick money up to the capo of, of the crew. Was In this case, the chief of police, Oriente, was basically like an organized crime don. According to the Star Ledger of Newark, former chief Alexander Oriente and seven active cops, including the chief's own son, will plead guilty and cooperate in the state's largest police corruption case ever. There were 12 officers arrested, including Chief Oriente. I think the reaction was shock and awe. This was definitely not the West New York that people thought they'd been a part of for their whole lives. Al Oriente Sr. and his son, Al Oriente Jr., both got cooperation agreements with the state in order to avoid sentences that could have gone 10 years and beyond. You have the king cooperating against his subjects to save himself. And, you know, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my career is, you know, the chief of police, you know, taking the stand at the trial. The chief went through a recitation of criminal conduct that he allowed to take place under his watch. And, you know, his men paid dearly for that. My dad never wanted to testify, but I believe eventually somebody would have. If it wasn't my dad, they would have went after somebody else. It was very surreal for him to be on the other side of that, from being a police officer to now being the person who was being offered this plea. All told, the case resulted in 28 guilty pleas, including 11 by West New York police officers. The corruption was so shocking and widespread that to this day, no single person has been given the sole power of police chief in West New York since. Mob boss Jose Grana and his son Jose Grana Jr. each received five-year federal prison sentences for bribery and conspiracy charges. Finally, when the dollars and cents were all accounted for, Chief Oriente had taken about $2 million in kickbacks and bribes a fact he would atone for on his day of reckoning. The day of the sentencing, my dad received two four and a half year sentences, but he was allowed to serve them simultaneously. 
It definitely was heartbreaking for me. I think what my brother did was very brave. Brave enough to the point that it was never done before him. He stood up alone. And without doing what he did, who's to say it wouldn't be happening to this day? At the end of the day, Rich Rivera definitely deserves credit for cleaning up this department. But even to this day, there's a lot of people that still hate him. Even though I got rid of a bunch of dirty cops, I destroyed my life. I destroyed all the friendships and relationships I had. I will carry this burden for the rest of my life. But what's done is done. Today, I'm back in the saddle. I'm working in policing again, and I love it every day. <laughs>